by popular demand, this week we're going to be talking about luxury, premier build quality, and a company that prides itself on their boat's ability to truly go anywhere in style and comfort. A British boat that, sadly, we just don't see enough of over here on our side of the pond. In 1973, a company was started that challenged what a cruising boat could be. This week on Everything You Need to Know, we're talking about Oyster. Last week, a few of you expressed that my audio wasn't loud enough. It hasn't been loud enough. So you have to turn your device all the way up. And then when an ad plays, it's eardrum blowing loud. Um, so we made some changes to the audio this week. Hopefully it's better. Let me know what you guys think. Also last week was my first time ever trying to shoot an episode in 4K. And what a cluster that was. Uh, we're back to 1080 right now to keep it simple. I'll tackle the 4K headache later. Uh, but the problems were sort of in post-production uh, where 4K became kind of a pain. Um, anyway, uh, I think I'm right in saying that so far on everything you, you need to know, we've only talked about boats that I've actually been on or very likely sailed on at least once. But we haven't talked about Oyster. And while I have seen them on the East Coast and down in the islands, I just haven't been on one. And not many of us have. And that's because while they do have some smaller sort of facilities here in North America now, that wasn't always the case. In 1973, a man called Richard Matthews founded Oyster and commissioned one boat, a 32-foot quarter tonner called UFO-2. UFO went on to win the 1974 Royal Yacht Squadron's Moss Cup. And with that success, they took that prototype 32, added two feet to the hull, and started stamping out their very first production boat, the UFO 34, which was an odd name for a boat, but it was one heck of a boat. The 34 is said to be a capable ocean boat. It's capable of ocean passages and crossings and handling what they call extreme weather conditions. And that is kind of supported by what happened next. Several UFO 34s ran in the 1979 Fastnet, and as we know, disaster struck, and many yachts and many sailors were lost to the sea. Between the tragic Fastnet of 79 and the 1998 Sydney to Hobart race, not a single UFO 34 was lost at all, or even had any real trouble. In fact, in Fastnet 79, a UFO 34 actually went on to win its class overall. We could honestly do an entire episode on the 34, but we're here to talk about Oyster as a whole. With that massive success of their very first boat, Oyster had a choice on where to go next. What would the company's future be? What would that look like? What were they gonna make and where would they fit into the market? They could have improved upon their mid 30 footer like many manufacturers did at the time and taken their race proven design and made it a little smaller and more affordable to sell to the masses. That was a very good business model at the time, but they didn't do that. They made a decision that would set the bar for their entire future. Their second boat would be a cruiser this time, not a racer, coming in at 46 feet, which was an extremely large boat in the 70s from a company that really only made one boat so far. But the 46 had something unique about it, something new to the sailboat game as far as mass production went that sort of set it apart from everyone else. It had something called a deck saloon. And yes, I said saloon, not salon. Let's cover that first. Both words mean the same thing by dictionary definition, so technically it doesn't matter which one you use. Some sources say the older, more traditional sailors tend to say saloon, and the newer breed of sailors and most power boaters tend to say salon. I'm saying saloon because it was spelled with two O's when Oyster made it. They spelled it with two O's, so I'm just respecting how they chose for it to be pronounced. Anyway, a deck saloon is basically a main cabin that is up on deck level. It means you don't go through the companionway and down into the bowels of the hull to enter your main cabin and galley area. This has a lot of benefits, but it also has a few cons. For the livability, a deck level cabin is astounding. The cabin and the cockpit come together to make one big room. Think catamaran. If you can't handle companionway stairs, great. Sometimes these deck level saloons don't even have any. You also get massive windows to really enjoy the view while you're underway or at anchor in tropical paradise where these boats usually go. Let's in lots of natural light. And in many cases, it gives you room for a helm in the cabin. So if the weather's bad, you don't have to sit tight and wait it out. You can keep making miles in the comfort of your own interior. Now, a deck saloon does have a lot in common with a pilot house, but the two should not be confused. 
A pilot house is more of half a deck saloon. It gives you a deck level cabin for steering and charting and sometimes some seating, but the main living accommodations are usually downstairs lower in the hull. Now the downsides of a deck saloon are probably fairly obvious. One of the big ones is windage. The bigger and taller sides of the boat, um, that means it's going to be pushed around a lot more by the wind and that usually means diminished sailing performance. The weight of the structure also comes into play because it puts a lot more of that weight high above the waterline, changing the center of gravity of the boat, which means more work has to be put into the counterbalance below the waterline. And of course, all this luxury comes at a price. It just costs more to build it from the R&D to the construction and coming up with a balance to make the thing sail properly. It is just a luxury item. And that's why I think we don't see a lot more deck saloon boats. Not many people wanted to pay the extra money to have that design. Lady K Sailing is brought to you by patrons, people who give a couple of bucks an episode to keep this channel improving. A big shout out to this week's newest patrons, Michael, Darren, and George. Thank you so much, guys. Welcome to the team. Unlike the 32 and the 34, the 46-footer was not a race boat. It had no intentions of becoming a race boat. This was a catch rig, came with a cruising style stay sail arrangement. Uh, she came with a long sort of modified fin keel with a skeg hung rudder. In her 32,000 pounds of weight would be an after master cabin with an ensuite head and her backup power was an 81 horse Perkins. This boat is truly a go anywhere tank. The 46 in Luxury Deck Saloon sort of set the tone for everything Oyster was going to do next, not to be outdone by their jump from a rather humdrum 34 to the Deck Saloon 46, they'd go on to make a 53 and then a 62. They're all the way up to 125 foot boats now. The founder Richard Matthews, after making his Oyster wildly successful, did eventually sell the company to a private investment firm called Balmoral, whose name we've actually heard before, they own a handful of boat manufacturers at this point. Balmoral sold it again later, though, to another private equity firm. While Oyster build quality and luxury have typically been considered top-notch, the company hasn't been without issue. In July of 2015, catastrophe struck. One of the new Oyster 825s, called Polina Star, sunk when the internal hull structure completely failed. That sounds terrifying. Polina Star was one of five hulls made like that that might fail, and the company went through great measures to recall the other four hulls before their reputation was damaged forever. They were successful, and as a result, the next two years saw about a third less orders in new boats from their company. 2018 marked a changing point for Oyster. The company was acquired by a video game developer named Richard Hadida. He bought the company and he was trying to restore it to its former glory, hiring back employees they had to let go and getting the production numbers back up, though I'm sure two years later, the global pandemic did not help things. Now, through its years, Oyster has always been quintessentially British. In the early years, when they would design boats and market boats, they didn't actually build them themselves. That was fairly common for the time. They would do what many designers did and subcontract boatyards to actually construct the boats. But they always picked British boatyards and British-based companies. Very few of their boats were ever made outside of Britain. The 54 was one example. It was made in New Zealand. And some of the biggest boats, the 100-foot, 125-foot boats, are made in Turkey. But in more recent years, Oyster has been bringing all of the manufacturing in-house, choosing to do everything themselves. Now, other than being the pinnacle, or one of the pinnacles, of cruising luxury and comfort, owning an Oyster also comes with some other perks, too. For example, they hold Oyster rallies. And this is pretty cool. Oyster puts on a rally for any Oyster owner to attend, where everyone gets together on their Oysters, to sail a pre-planned route around the world. It often takes two to three years if you go on one of these rallies. Can you imagine a company saying, hey owners, we're gonna get together with all the other owners and spend three years cruising around on our oysters. Meet us in Finland in 2022, BYOB. How cool is that? Okay, so on to the obvious question we probably all have. Putting aside that the 80 something footers go anywhere from three million to seven million US dollars, is there an oyster that normal people can afford? And the answer is yes. On the UK side of the pond, you can have a mid 30 footer for about 30 grand, which is kind of on par with any other mid 30 footer kind of from the 80s. For between 50 and 100 grand, you can have the 40 to 50 footers, which again is kind of on par with other boats from that size and vintage. The price is about right. 
but you get an oyster. The problem with any of these is you just don't find them very often on American shores. You'd have to be willing to get them from across the Atlantic, which presents a problem. But let's be honest, if you're in the market for an oyster, you probably have oyster money, which means you're probably willing to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars to have an oyster. And that's sort of where they fit in. That's their niche market in the used boat world. A couple hundred grand, so let's say sub 200,000 American, is going to net you a 50 to 60 footer, which you'll find all over the Caribbean, much closer to home. And if you're buying a boat in the Caribbean and you're especially an oyster and you're trying to get it back to the eastern seaboard, call me. I'm very much down for that ride. So most of these 50 to 60 footers are deck salon, aft cabin, luxury apartment type boats. And they have a lot more in common with the likes of Amel than anything that we build over here. Um, but like Amel, they are truly designed to go anywhere. They are blue water, full stop. Would you rather cross the Atlantic on a 50-foot oyster or a 50-foot Beneteau? That's it for this week, guys. If you like the video, please give me a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, hit subscribe. I will see you guys next week.